Good evening. I want to welcome all of you to, I think, the fourth lecture in our series, third or fourth, fourth faculty lecture series. And uh, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce Richard Warner to you tonight, which uh, I'm sure you are familiar with his work already and is teaching here at SIRC for the last three, four years and at uh, USC, I believe, before that. Um, I actually, as an architect, grew up with Richard. We went to Cal Poly, San Luis, Obis uh, San Luis Obispo together. And also, were, uh, we were fortunate, fortunate enough to study in Florence, Italy for a year. And were exposed at that time to uh, you know, the brilliant work of Super Studio of Cristiano Toraldo di Francia and uh, other architects like Brunelleschi, and we went to Vicenza and saw Palladio, and it was really a, um, a formulative experience for, for both of us. And rather than describing his work, I thought that I would sort of condense everything down to one sentence and say this about him, that in him, I recognized the soul of the architect, which is something I wouldn't say about everyone. Uh, and I reserve that for a few people, and Richard is one of them, and he's somebody who I respect uh, tremendously and has uh, influenced me and in my thinking, uh, my, the, the mode of architecture that I make in a, in a really uh, substantive way. So without further ado, Richard Warner. The soul of the architect. C can you hear? Can you hear? Can, can you hear? Yeah. You can hear? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I wonder if I have the appearance of the architect as well. Uh, but I always asp I aspire to the soul of the architect, of course. Um, the, uh, it's been kind of a weird month. I had pneumonia, and then I had to get over that. And then I was working on this preschool that I was really excited about, way too excited about, in fact. My wife kept saying, calm down. <laughs> you know what happens. All right, so uh, got very involved in that. It was going really well, presented a design solution. They loved it. And then typically what happens in architecture when you're trying to build things is that um, he went temper the client went temporarily insane and decided to spend no money on the building. It was, a, it was a renovation of an existing building. So then I had to get over like, you know, I had to recover from that and do the other work that I have to do. Sound familiar? It's like kind of like having a bad review and then having to recover from it and go on to still try and do good work. So, um, so I'm better now but I wanted to share that with you. Um, I actually, the, the title of the lecture is Recent Works, I guess, but I don't actually, I don't have a lot of recent work that i uh, prepared to show you. It's kind of this messy process of being halfway between hired and fired on these projects that the budget's constantly changing. And I have a recently completed project and uh, one that uh, I feel obligated to show you even though it's probably never gonna be built. Uh, and then kind of background work, some of the stuff that's been done over the last few years, um, actually with a partner who I had at the time. So what I think I'll do is just try and talk about some of the salient ideas or points that I think occur in the different projects. And um, I mean, you can probably tell whether there's a linkage there or not. But I definitely like to hear people's uh, feedback or, uh, and or um, definite praise, of course. Just, that's all I want to hear. So, let's see, for, if I just push this, is it going to work? Uh, I am pushing and we are not having results.
Actually, I also wanted to add that it's a dubious honor to be here um, because, you know, this is a chance for people to talk to me about my work after having spent a lot of time talking to other people about their work, you know, mixed reviews. So remember, it's be, be, be kind. <laughs> I mean, you know, remind yourself. You're in a position of power here, so you need to be kind. So are we ready? Yeah, it's good, huh? Okay, so um, this is, a, I actually, I've done pretty much the same slides before, but always in the same direction, so I just turned everything backwards, because I get really tired of seeing them in the same way. So I'm, I'm starting from, I'm going instead of from, you know, years ago to now, I'm going from now to years ago, but completely reversed, like detailed to the general, you know. Okay, so instead of going from general to specific, I'm going from specific to general. And then from now, backwards. But this is a, this is a, um, this was just completed in July, uh, a bakery in Santa Barbara that involved about 2,400 square feet in an existing space and um, 600 feet of it, which were like a, Retail, you know, you can go and you get sandwiches, you can sit. So there's this kind of discussion about whether or not, these are slightly more chaotic shots, but you can see um, the two earlier photographs, these are kind of of this, of this valence that surrounds the mezzanine. You can see there's like a mezzanine in the upper right there, and this slide. And then this uh, copper bar, 45 foot long copper bar that divides the public space from the kind of retail. Um, or from the wholesale bread production space. But the oven in the middle that you see in the left there is about a quarter of the budget, the total budget for the project. It's like 170 grand in equipment and 140 in build out. Most of it's plumbing, electrical, tile, that kind of stuff. So there's like a few dollars left for you know, architecture, or whatever. And so the whole the question became, well, how do we, how do we take Essentially, one little tiny piece of the budget, which is normally allocated to architecture, like if you're working on a larger building, be the skin or something, um, and actually make all the equipment part of that. So the oven became a $70,000 piece, which really is the focal point of the, um, which is the focal point of the kind of the business as well as the activity of the space, and made that the heart. And on the um, I guess, yeah, looking at on the right, slide on the right, there was existing windows along that side, and so, you know, they had direct problems with direct sunlight. So, so it built this wall that's suspended from the wall and is uh, light transmitting plastic, and so light comes through but not direct sunlight. So it still illuminates the space without having, you know, issues of direct sunlight. But one of the things that is carried over from the earlier work, which you'll see, is this kind of dismantling of the the, the pieces of the project. And in terms of this project, it's, it's specifically manifested as a kind of wishing that there was, a, an, that there was an internal skin that, that was like on the inside of the framing, and like there's an outer skin that's on the outside of the framing. And really this whole building, which appears to be solid, is made up of sticks. But that you could somehow art, isolate and articulate the separate planes. But, but uh, being limited in resources, and actually, you know, the, the building being a, a kind of a, mi a mix of hype, uh, masonry, some steel. Sort of picking up on this idea in abstract of pulling out second skins, like this is a second skin on the interior space of the building. And, um, you know, this, uh, this membrane enclosing the um, mezzanine as being like a second skin. And if you go back, let's see here back to this one. Like in the upper left, there's like a plywood um, valence that comes out that has lighting behind it that's actually like reforming the, 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 the hip roof where it meets the wall, pulling that out and placing light pictures behind it. So if you have this kind of peeling away of the internal skin, or this imagined internal skin, so you have like an envelope within the existing envelope that can then be cut and modified, and then the materials change. So it, 
sort of has an episodic quality when you're in there, and it actually seems quite bigger than the, uh, the slides. But there's an existing geometry, and a lot of the, the angles and things that you see come from um, like the trusses and the, the interior shapes of the hipped and gabled roofs. So, you know, this is the kind of thing where you go into the space and, you know, it's all open and it's all basically this steel that's there and the, this ceiling planes that are there and you're sort of asking yourself, well, you know, they're going to fill this place with equipment and now what? <laughs> and that's more than half the budget for the project. And so really, it, it just became about Make, maintaining that space as large as possible and then developing these certain practical surfaces played a role like the bar, like this skin, like the enclosure of the, the mezzanine and following through on this idea of the of this uh, second skin. But the, uh, the, right, the slide on the right is a, one of the computer studies that was done during the design. Um, there was a few of those done, but they, I don't think, they actually followed sort of a, a model. There was this really, very badly made and expedient model that was made out of like cardboard and paper and stuff. Um, and kind of built over and over and over again. And, and, and then that became kind of, the, that became the precursor to the studies which were done on the computer. And the, the computer studies became a way of uh, sort of thinking about materials and analyzing the visual magnitude of surfaces that you couldn't or you couldn't really see in the model that well. So that's uh, you can see there's certain changes in the space. You know, one of the things that I kept thinking about on this project was that architecture, as I understood it or have been understanding it, is essentially inaccessible and not not affordable. And so I have this current dilemma, it's a byproduct of working for you know a few years. And that is that good architecture is not available to us. And so I think it presents a kind of ethical dilemma. And I've been asking myself, in this project in particular, when the client says to me, well, we really like your work, and when we're very sorry, we apologize, we have no money. <laughs> you know, that the basic implication is that they can't do architecture with what they have. And I mean, it makes, made me kind of angry. That, that all the things that I've learned how to do and all the things that I can think about as an architect have led me to the place where I can't do architecture and provide people with great space, even if they don't have huge resources. It's like you're designing for some kind of a Mercedes crowd or something. It's like, okay, if you can't buy that, then you can't have architecture. So I become fascinated with the idea of cheapness as being kind of having a, a, a ethical value in and of itself and this um, kind of working in plastic and working in fabric and working in canvas. There's some examples, this is sort of where I am right now, and there's other projects I'm working on that have this stuff going on in it. But, this is what I'm going to show you. This project, you know, those walls cost half as much as a, a, as a kind of glazed window wall. This project is kind of, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure why I'm showing it to you. Uh, Committed a lot of energy and time to it and invested a lot of, uh, you know, what I know. And, and the probability is that it'll never be built. But to me, it became, it became kind of like a, a, a I don't know what, what do you call it, like a, a a point of uh, annoyance so that, I, that brought me to this place that I'm at now, <laughs> where you, you kind of, you know, where this this is like I really like this project, but this project is you know pro probably never going to happen. So where's where's the basic flaw in in the assessment of the, the architecture as something of quality and the inaccessibility of it or unattainability of it as a kind of work. But this is a second floor, like second story remodel to an existing house. The lower piece on the right is, um, is an existing house that's quite a bit modified. And then the second floor was added. And I struggled, struggled, struggled with how to make this house seem like it was one house. It was kind of an early, inexpensive case study type. It wasn't one of the case study series, but it was built as a sort of thick modern uh, bungalow of about 1,000 square feet. And, um, the client actually was, was, they were really great, except they didn't have any idea about the value of things. And I sort of let them not have about that idea about the value of things. I realize now when I say, well, let's do this. And I'm like, yeah, that's a really great idea. Yeah, God, I, you have such great ideas, man. You know, and we're going back and forth with the client. And, and they go, well, how much is that going to cost? Oh, I'm not really sure. Uh, there's, you know, the, the, 
then they can think anything they want. You know, they can think it's two thousand dollars instead of tw you know twenty or four instead of forty or whatever they want to think they can. So instead of being this kind of which I I become a kind of money um, nut. You know, I just can't separate the idea of managing the resources of the project from a design standpoint from managing the resources of the project from a a budget standpoint because I know that the project has no chance of surviving it unless you do both of those things. And that sounds so boring and prosaic and it really is except I have this idea about building <laughs> and so if you accept the conditions of building then you increase the probability of building or you increase the probability of being successful. And uh, managing your time is like an instrument for being successful in a project while well, the other resources that are, that are part of the success of the project Managing those properly is just, you know, it's part of what you do to meet your goal. So again, this is, this is a, you know, built models out of wood and really got into the detailing of it. And this is a uh, computer model of the, this is actually these computer models in the are all done in AutoCAD. Uh, and this, uh, this is like interior. Did, you know, kind of working in a tactile way. I mean, I still think of actually doing drawings and building models as being a sort of a tactile understanding of the project. It's a specific method. It's not like an anachronism or an improper substitute, you know, a sort of a, a substitute for working in a computer. It's just another way of working. You take information in about the project in a different way. So let's see. Yeah, this was, this is, this is uh, probably permanently on hold and, and never going to happen. But it's formative, and it, and it leads to, you know, where, wherever I'm coming from now. So actually, when you draw, I think when you draw by hand, you feel the dimensions and the, and, the, and the size of things. And I've gotten, from working on the computer and doing computer models and stuff, this kind of weird sensation of disembodied representation, which I think is a lot different from drawing, physically drawing. And as your fingers move like an inch, three quarters of an inch, I mean, there's no relationship between the, the scale of motion and gesture of your arms, movement of your body, and the physical representation itself. I mean, when you're drawing, draw a line, right, that it's intended to extend into space, or somehow representing in the drawing the, the, the directional quality of the space or how the space moves, then, then, then that gesture is connected intuitively to the represent. I mean, to the space, to the representation, and I think what, the computer kind of separates you from all that. So I have this idea that, that which is, you know, there's nothing new about this. I just, I just think it separates you physically even further in a way, even though it may be able to model in terms of perspective and stuff. So I was doing this kind of drawing, which was constructed by hand and doing it, sounds redundant, but uh, it didn't feel redundant, actually. The results were sort of redundant when you stand back and you look at them. But I actually, as it worked out, I like the, the hand drawings more than I like the computer drawings. So computer drawings have this kind of cartoon quality. So I'm just wrestling with this uh, idea, of, I'm wrestling with this sense that the computer right now is really um, kind of a cartoon machine, makes cartoons. So I'm wrestling with this idea, the problems of representation on the computer. It's, it's very easy to think that and, and have the, the outward appearance of kind of re truthful representation, but it's still uh, kind of a simulation. It just, it pretends to be less, of, more, it pretends to be a better simulation, and, and in fact, it's, it's equally inadequate. So you're still structuring, you're structuring a, an idea, a representation on, on, on your own of the project through these various means that you have available to you, and no one method is a sort of ultimate solution. But the plan of the second floor was really, uh, you know, just like an open bedroom plan and, and uh, lots of glass, deck, split level because the roof was sloping, the bridge across to the site behind because it's a sloping lot. Really just trying to reach out and connect to the site on the hillside house, which is like this basically uh, a sort of essential problem. You figure out how on a hillside house to connect to the land, then, you, then that's really great, <laughs> period. I mean, it's not enough, but that, that's, that's pretty good. If you looked at hillside houses and the way they're designed in general, they separate themselves from the landscape and you can get very involved in however they're made or however they appear. The fact remains that they're separated from the landscape. It's like being inside the terrarium, sort of this separation. 
Anyway, this, um, this is a little playhouse which I designed a couple of years ago for a benefit. And um, it's all made out of fabric, different kinds of fabric, uh, different kinds of uh, degrees of uh, openings and perforation. And it's like a kid's playhouse. So there weren't any kinds of rules about, at least as far as I kind of baggage that I brought to it about, well, you know, architecture is supposed to be like this, and, and this is what architecture is made of. And I just kind of designed this thing like uh, it was some kind of foliage animal thing. Not, I mean, there weren't, really, there weren't like technical analogies, but I sort of thought of it as like leaves or whatever. But the cool thing about it, as far as I was thinking, was that it was really lightweight. It was relatively, it was the two people could pick it up and move it. The whole thing was made out of fabric, which breaks down, but then so does everything else you make buildings out of, except, you know, like lead and stone, which most people can't afford anyway. <laughs> so I've got, I mean, I've done some proposals recently where I've kind of, ex this became like a teaser project. I mean, it got me thinking. And so I've done these some projects where, uh, just did an office project, uh, well, it was a proposal for this nonprofit outfit where they, you know, again, they said, well, you don't have any money. Um, you know, which seems like that's what everybody says. But some people are lying. They just say that because they want you to think they don't have any, but you can figure it out, you know, when they do and they don't. So, any, so anyway, to, to make, to just, this is something that's connecting into the idea of economy. Like this fabric is $15 a, a running yard, but the, but the bolts are like 60 inches. So if you can, and then and then it's so what does it end up being? It's like some infinitesimally small amount per square foot. Okay, so then if you take the frame, take that number and you triple it, which is for framing and installation, and everything, you get like an absurdly low number for a really great architectural surface that diffuses light, that can be manipulated in so many ways, in a lot of ways, and it costs like practically nothing compared to trying to do it out of, even trying to do it out of Lexan, like that other project, you know, that stuff was $7 a square foot to build the walls and the steel studs and everything else. And uh, just a uh, girt glass wall, of just a, just a, uh, yeah, just a, just a curtain wall. It's like $20, you know, square foot. So you're talking about a third of the cost of that and the fabric's even less than, the, you know, fabric's like a six or something. So where do you use this stuff? How do you use it? How can you use it? I mean, that's all about you know, being an architect and trying to figure out what your spatial you know, uh, intentions are and purposes. purposes are. This is a model that was made of the, uh, the, you know, of the playhouse. Um, and it wasn't intended to be a light fixture when I designed it, but it ended up being one when we photographed it. Um, it kind of has, you know, it's derivative of Noguchi. And I mean, I'm sure you could like, make some other sorts of connections, which actually doesn't bother me at all. If, if, if I was going to steal from anybody, I think he'd be great to steal from. So this is made out of just this wax masa paper and welded, welded copper. It was really fun to make a model like that. It's not very big. So let's see. Um, women's clothing store in Santa Monica. This is done with my ex-partner as is all the work that follows. Uh, you may recognize there's a wall in here. There's a big tower in the Edgemar Mall. This 42 foot high with a glass volume on top, which you can see. It's Q. This is one of the problems of going backwards, general specific, in that. So they had way too much light, so we hung this parachute. This is for $100, that parachute. But I think the alternative was to do nothing. To say, well, you have $100, okay. Well, I, it doesn't, it doesn't, I like it, you know. I mean, it even has the patches and stuff. I mean, I like the holes. The holes are fixed. It's kind of graphic quality in the space. But it's essentially, um, yeah, so, so there was this X bracing in, in the space that was existing to hold the tube. And then there's this idea of the folded wall, which is like a screen that you dress behind, that you move around in a space. And so that became a storage wall. And then inscribed within this, this kind of circle. And I think this is the precursor to the idea of the interior skin. It's like there's an implied volume. Let's see if one of these shows it better than another. Sorry to be going back and forth, but. 
makes it look like I have more slides. It's like editing, you know, like a video. Okay, so I guess from that, from that slide on the left, you can kind of see that inscribed within this existing volume is like $2,000 worth of 5 8 inch diameter steel rod that's bent. <laughs> you know, bent this way, bent that way, and then suspended. And then these shelves on the right, which you can see, kind of form the completion of the bottom of the cylinder. So this kind of tentatively implied <laughs> cylinder is graphically described by the lines of the steel and by the shelves and by the suspended garment. So there's like this, you know, it's, you could say that it's classical, and then you could say, well, it's not really. But, but it kind of has a volume within a volume, and there's like a circle within a square, sort of. But it's this idea that was going goes goes is carried on through to um, the D'Angelo Bakery, where there's like if you just assume from the starting point that there's a second skin that wraps the entire space. Like in this room, you can imagine, come out from the wall a foot on each side, come down from the beam or the duct a foot, and just imagine there's a skin wrapped in here, a second skin in this room. It just exists, and behind it is everything the ducts and all this, and then you come back in and then you can modify that skin. And you can say, well, I'm going to remove certain parts of it. I'm going to put skylights in other places above and behind it. I'm going to change the materials of it in certain locations in order that the room seems to be much larger. In fact, it is visually much larger because you have layering of space and windows onto other spaces and this kind of variation in light level and material level. It's this kind of, you know, sort of transparency results. So, I mean, this is like, like the first, I don't think we thought about it, I didn't think about it really until after, in those terms, until after the project was actually completed. But, um, let's see, I think the cab, it was like an $8,000 project. You know, so, uh, how much money do you think I made on that one? Not very much. So, but that's not really the point. Um, anyway, the, the precursor to this, per, precursor to that kind of screen idea in that store is really just, you know, we built some furniture and we built this piece just out of three materials, plywood and steel and glass as a kind of articulated screen as a piece of furniture and, um, you know, this, that, I, you know, just to be completely candid about sources, you know, I, that came from looking at a lot of deco work, but I don't think it's, I don't think of it as being deco, you know, of that period of the 30s but it's a way of forming interiors. If you look at Jean-Michel Franck and you look at some other people's work, Eileen Gray, you know, there's some really clearly principled stuff that they were doing that it's colored by peculiarities or particular, char particular characteristics of the period, which, is, which seem to date it, but some of, that, some of those core qualities follow through. So I thought this idea of a articulated screen, anyway, we just picked up on it. And then a, a, a lamp that we designed, um, again, this is being done with my ex-partner, uh, a lamp that we designed just a brass, you know, a glass tube and a steel table. This is a little project that another, like, you know, nothing budget and we did it ourselves, painted a wall, put a rolling steel door in. Actually, we didn't do the steel work, somebody else did that, subcontracted the steel out. Formed an office using fabric. So there's like specific examples of the use of this material and sort of standing back and looking at it and going, okay, what's next? So what do we do with it now? Um, rolling steel door, steel plate. Are they in sequence? Somebody in, I think I might, well, I don't know if it matters actually. So you can see still this idea of articulating planes. Um, can I ask how we're doing for time? Are we like, Oh, okay. should I go faster or slower? Okay, so that's the plan over there. <laughs> this is a house in Malibu that did a uh, ground up house on a, on a uh, sloping site um, with this detached studio in the back, a bridge across from the detached studio in the back. So this elliptical piece that you see on the right is way up on the high part of the site with this bridge coming across from this, from the, what is really a third floor. You can see the upper left there kind of poking up above and looking out over the existing house. This slide on the left is a second floor master bedroom. This house literally, is, I mean, I'm sure there were things that we didn't know how to do, like to get more glass in a house, but, but I don't know. I, didn't, I don't think we, we could figure out at, the, at that time how to get any more glass in that house. It's like literally, 
it was a 5,400 square foot floor plan. We ended up with like 2,800 square feet of glazed wall, and like you know, did all these things to get it to work in terms of the Title 24 stuff. You know, double, you know, whatever, double glazing, you know, you know, thermal mass, air conditioning, sunshade devices. You know, and then all these people say, well, God, you know, you just can't do that. But I guess it's probably fairly inefficient, but it's a really nice house. But the thing is, is the thing is here, even with this house, it's $140 a square foot, and the whole thing was treated like loft space. And on a hillside, it's hard to do it for less than that. If you guys want me to stop talking about money, I will. Um, so like plywood floors upstairs, you know, just we took a regular glass door and we sandblasted parts of it. Um, essentially, it's just sta a standard storefront window system throughout in which we just use different kinds of glass. The one kind of indulgence, uh, really, there's really only one in, no, there are two indulgences. One indulgence was the elliptical form of the studio, which ended up, there was, you know, costing a lot of money. Not the form itself, but the part of the site that it was on because that's where it changed to a one-to-one -one slope. And, uh, you know, the conclusion now is, I think, Emma and Lorcan would probably agree that that studio should have never been built because it killed kind of the available resources for the rest of the project. Um, you know, I mean, that thing just sucked. I mean, that thing was probably 200 bucks over, two, like 250 a square foot, maybe 300 for this little 600 square foot piece. and. and I know, I know architects aren't supposed to talk about the problems of projects or whatever they learned, you know, but it's like a perfect thing, right, a fait accompli. There's nothing wrong with it, nothing to be learned, it's just absolute. But I have this bad habit, this candor thing. It's not going to go away. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you just, you learn certain things. And I think even with this house at $140 a square foot, it's like, uh, that's too much money. If you want to build a house, where are you going to, you're going to come up with a, you know, all that money to build a house? Why can't you do it for half of that? What if I do it out of plastic and fabric? What's wrong with that? So what if it starts to fall apart? I mean, it starts to fall apart anyway. And somebody buys it and remodels the whole thing or tears it all apart because they don't like it, don't like the design, or they think the design's different. It's partic particularly clear with, you know, commercial. I mean, if you do a commercial project, you just, you just, just accept the fact that within a couple of years it's going to be gone. Or somebody's going to come in and pose it a different color or put such a, a monstrous sign on it that you can't even tell you know, what the original intent was. I mean, that's what commercial projects are about. So you have to ask yourself this question. Well, the purpose at hand really is not to have this thing which is permanent. The purpose at hand is really to discover something about, this, about space and about material, arrive at a place where you know more than you knew before and where it can be enjoyed by everybody and hopefully some people vicariously, not necessarily direct participants. And, and, uh, and then forget about it and move on. I mean, not hang on to it as this kind of precious thing that you did, but just accept the fact that it's gonna get burned down or gonna, gonna get painted some color that, you know. I mean, I, I'm kind of, I've gotten to this, yeah, well. This whole thing about money is also connected to a, a, an idea that I have about the impermanence, the necessary impermanence of architecture. Um, I mean, it's great, I love it, you know, but I'm tired of it. I mean, I didn't actually want to show you these slides, but I have to because, you know, this is my work. I'm supposed to show my work. Um, but the thing that... I have a son that's three years old, and... Um, some, some people, I know, some of you have kids, some, you know, a lot of you don't. But, um, you know, when the, it's so great when he gets older and he gets smarter and, like, he has his third birthday or second birthday or whatever, it's really great. But there's always this kind of sadness because the thing that was isn't anymore and he moved on and everything's changing. And I think that this whole idea about nostalgia is really kind of a resistance to the necessary progress of things. And so this kind of idea, this kind of traditional idea, in architecture that I grew up with, and I still have, and I actually would very much like to get rid of, this kind of tendency that I have to think of architecture as necessarily being this permanent sort of statement of a culture at this time, or of myself as a manifestation of ego that's lasting like this, you know, like, uh, it's like you watch the riverbed and you see how the riverbed changes things and that's exactly how cities are formed, you know? 
and the buildings are changed and the buildings are, uh, they, they, you know, they fall apart and they don't hold up. So that's, I mean, that's kind of, that's connected to this idea of impermanence. Like it's okay that, if, that this is a little bit loose, so I don't know if you guys are going to make the connection, but I'm just throwing it out there anyway. Um, this actually, I mean, I love these projects, which I did, but in some ways, the fact that they're unattainable for most people, I find a little bit annoying. And I'd like to try and figure out how to do really great, and this is what I'm sort of working on now, the fabric, and just, you know, making buildings more simply out of, um, uh, you know, alternative materials. This, uh, you know, this glass, there's this glass in this building like this channel glass stuff that we had brought over from Germany. We had just enough of it to fill a container so that when you paid for the container, which is like $3,000 or $4,000 to have the container brought over from Frankfurt, I think is where the manufacturer is, you know, then it didn't add that much to the cost of the material just to have it brought over. But nobody here knew how to do it and everybody's scared of it. But it still ended up costing not that much more than just a standard storefront system. So whereas the storefront maybe on this job is like $17 a square foot or something, and this ended up being like 25 for this channel glass. Fact is, it's still, I mean, it's still pretty cheap, but it's, it's like, I mean, you can't do it over and over and over again. I mean, it's just not there. It's not, there's not a place for it. But anyway, it was used here on the sides, right, the sides of the project. Because it's a narrow lot, 50 feet wide, five foot setbacks on each side. So you want to have this openness, and you want to have this kind of glazing, you know, sense of connection to the exterior. You can see leaves and colors and shadows against the glass, and it accomplishes that, even though it's a relatively narrow lot with five foot setbacks on each side. One of the things that we did do was uh, this, these two slides right night and day, which is push the building over. Like another, I think, I guess this, we, we, we created a, like a 15 foot setback on that side so that you have an easement, we created an easement within the lot so there's a garden ascending in steps and then kind of in the plan you can see it in the slide on the left a little more clearly that there's a flat area that pushes into the building so the building gets even thinner there. So there's like an entry uh, garden courtyard idea that connects directly to the view, connects to the landscape in as direct a way as possible which is the essential problem of hillside houses is this kind of you know, eerie, where you're, wherever, whenever you look out a window, the ground is way down there. Or there's some kind of a, a structural deck that you stand on that's all about supports and still being detached from the ground. And the whole idea of physically having your feet on the ground is not really consistent. So we were working on this idea that, okay, well, we want to be able to connect to the landscape. And the other way to do that, by, instead of pushing the house over, making the house narrower than it needed to be, really but as narrow as it needed to be to get some kind of a continuous easement on one side. Uh, stepping it, you can see how it slips. Like there's a, this, the roof structure on the right over the living room is, pops up and then the floor level for the second floor bedroom it drops down. And uh, so we shifted the floor plates as you go back. This is a one to two, basically one to one and a half, one to two slope for the site. So if you shift the floor plates, Stories have access from a room to the grade. Right, you're always, you could try and get the rooms as close to grade as you can. Well, that doesn't seem very theoretical. I mean, so it's just a garden. It's just landscape views. I mean, who cares about that stuff? Anyway, this is mostly steel in the front and then solid bearing wall in the back. And uh, the garage door is actually perforated metal, so at nighttime the light comes through, and at daytime the light comes in, so it kind of has this mem almost like membrane quality for a low, low price. So these are uh, construction shots. They're just the color negatives. It's more interesting to look at these than actual, you know, the actual slides. If you see steel, it's the thing is, thing is what I, I looked at those slides, and I. I don't necessarily see steel, I see kind of incipient geometry. 
It's like kind of linear graphic description of future volumes and, and these walls below is kind of a planar description of the relationship of the building to the ground plane or the setback or the slope of the, of the site. When I look at these pictures, it's like color photographs or color slides, I see, con I see concrete and I see steel. <laughs> so it kind of uh, removes the material clarity and uh, brings back some of the original kind of graphic intentions that were reflected in the first design. So that's the plan. You can see on the left how you come walking around where the pool was never built to the deck. The pool is always the dispensable part of the project. You should, whenever you're working on projects in the future, you design, make sure you design a dispensable part, disposable part, because the budget will always be over. And then if you just have this piece, you can just remove without hurting, the, you know, dramatically hurting the project. I'm being sarcastic, but that I mean, every pool, every house you've ever designed a pool for, the pool doesn't get built because you know because that's easily removed from the project without. But in any case, the open plan, living room, um, and, and that's light to the left, the kitchen, and then you go up the kind of round plan stair, this building shifts planes, the back half and the front half, where it shifts envelope from glass to solid wall, it also shifts floor plane and shifts use from open plan, kind of public to solid wall, private. And then the plan on the right, shows a stair coming up. That stair is enclosed in glass, so that you still have a sense of dimension. Master bedroom opening onto deck, looking out over the ocean. You know, master bedroom suite with the study area and closet, all that. But you can see the bridge uh, connecting to the studio. Yeah, but see the setback on the upper side and the setback on the lower side? Like that's, just, we just pushed it over as far as we could. Okay, so that's like one of the first models. I had to cut back on the glass. Actually, even an earlier model. The drawing on the left is uh, like the very first diagram that was done in the project. Let's see if I get that. Yeah. So this is plan in the middle on the slide on the right, section elevation on you know of that side, and section elevation of that side. And actually, the other the two parts that aren't in this slide is above, there was an elevation of that end, and then below, there's an elevation of that end. So on one sheet of paper, it's like a drawing that shows unfolded all the sides and the surfaces. So the volumes can be mapped out on one piece of paper. So you didn't have to kind of get another sheet and reorient it, and figure out, OK, how does that relate to the plan? You just sort of lay it out flat, like this Egyptian lake drawing that sometimes appears, sometimes appears in uh, history drawings, where you see the plan of the Egyptian lake and the boats like on its side, the ceremonial lake, and the trees are all flat. Everything's like flattened out, like the elevation is right there on the plan. Anyway, um, so you could e easily just track where volumes were going. And then the model came from this, right? And then another model came from that and the drawings. It actually went very quickly and there, was, there were no reversals of direction or, or really dramatic changes at all, which... Um, yeah, this is a house in the Palisades that was done almost simultaneously, except it took two years to build, two, and a, two, two years and four months to build, while the other one took like I, 16 months. So the other one caught up with this one and they finished about the same time. But this is the front area and that's some of the similar ideas you can see, the thinness of planes, thinness of roof planes, translucency of walls. It's that same glass. It's a bridge or a cross connecting the new building to the older one. And then the back. Um, the existing house, as you can see clearly here, the second floor was not changed at all. The lower half had this kind of solid plaster quality immediately above, which stacked on top as a sort of wood part. And we picked up on it in the piece that you can see beyond. There's kind of a lower solid volume, which contains the bedrooms, and then the upper translucent volume, which, is contain, which contains the, the library, it's the kitchen. This project was probably, like, parts of it, over $300 a square foot. And I think the project probably averaged out to be about $250, maybe $250 a square foot. So you can see, actually, the way the sort of thinness is achieved is that the glass goes past the depth of the structure, and so the you know, it's like a window box. You have columns, 
which is the kind of the, this is a precursor to this idea of the second skin, which, which is reflected in the interior project, is where you have a second, where you actually have the exterior skin is pulled away from the structure, columns, walls, whatever, and goes by, so that the glass actually becomes like a viewing, or just a, you know, like a, a vitreous membrane that, that contains these, the entire structure. So this band across the top is really just kind of an elaboration of the curb that stops the, the roofing. So you project it out and it becomes a line, but you can see the depth of structure behind it and the columns and whatnot. So that's, yeah, the right shot is the bridge crossing over to the library. And, um, and then the left is out on the deck, you can see glass block skylight looking at the volume of the library. Behind which you can kind of see the aluminum plates that are covering up the, the framing of the structure and the wall and then the bridge across to the existing house. So this whole, I think this whole house, there was a lot of, I mean, you can see the, the references, but pretty clearly, but I think there's a kind of articulation, there was really an intention to articulate the idea that these constituent geometries build upon each other and the clarity of these constituent geometries being, you know, line, plane, volume, can be established by, by the distinctions between materials for line or plane or for volume. So you see the steel windows, the guardrails, the, the, those kinds of things become like a gra kind of a graphic and linear, um, well, they're required, I mean, you need them, right, from an architectural standpoint, but they, be they become the kind of linear element in the spatial ensemble. And then you have like the, the uh, you know, a plane of, of ash or a plane of stone. It becomes, starts to become a planar element of the ensemble. And even the deck is, is pulled up on the edge. It's very, a lot of effort going into like making sure that when you stand out on the deck, you see the line, which is the boundary of the concrete. It's floating up from the, from the, from the, from the metal. It's very clear that there's a plane of material there. At least that's, you know, that was the goal. I think, it's, I think it happened. So, let's see. Yeah, stuff like this is actually, you know, like in this slide on the right, where that wood comes in to that plaster, I think I showed this to some graduate students here a couple of years ago, but, um, you know, see how it just comes in and just goes right by the plaster? You know how many fights you have to have with a contractor to make that happen? like four or five and actually in that picture there's there's a lot of one there's a lot of battles won but see that the where the flashing comes down two inches I, I hate that it should come down just an inch and the guy contractor said well you can't get it an inch I said well yeah sure you can I've seen it right no, I can't get it. So, of course, the owner's in the meeting, right? And she believes in the show. She says, just do it, you know. So he just does it, and it's two inches. Next job, I go, can we just have it an inch, please? Oh, yeah, no problem. He go, goes, gets it, you know, puts it on the building, and it's no big deal. No, there's fights about other things. But that, you know, that's, that's just the... But actually, this worked out pretty well. It's like precast sills. There's a lot of investment in detailing. Like these sills are all precast concrete. The windows are all set back. One of the reasons it was so expensive is because of the amount of steel work. It's the windows themselves delivered to the site. No glazing, no paint, not installed. It was $70,000 just for the frames because they're steel. The existing house was steel. It had steel windows. So we wanted the steel. So this kind of really delicate graphic quality that you get with the windows. Like that, just lines. You know, you can get that in aluminum, but they're a little bit bigger in aluminum, and the detailing doesn't work out quite as well because the welding is different and stuff. You get like aluminum to look really lightweight, but not like that. You know, that's seventy thousand dollars. It's like it shouldn't be like so precious. If I want to build a house, you know, for myself, or you guys want to build, one of you wants to build a house for yourself, why should? Where should the threshold be in terms of how much you have to sacrifice, you know, of your daily lives to, to fund? you know, the development of the architecture so that you can be satisfied. Where's the threshold where you can, like, I mean, read the row or something, I don't know. Figure out what the minimum is. 
or what the, what the, what's attainable. So that's it floating up on the caisson over there. You can see it, it floats off the ground so the roots are protected on these Italian stone pines. Really great trees. Just, you know, incredible trees. So that when you're up on top of this, when you're up on top of this roof deck, it's like you're underneath the tree canopy and you're on top of the roof. And actually at nighttime, the internal lights light up that glass box skylight, so that glass box skylight lights up the canopies of the trees. You know, you can't beat it. I mean, except for, you know, it costs too much. So that's, um, yeah, the whole thing, essentially it's wood, wood framing on top of steel, is steel. It sits on these caissons that go 16 feet down. Those caissons are really just the two points in the slide on the right, but you can see how the trees, you know, if they had voices, they'd be like thanking. Actually, it makes a better project to have the trees there than to not have them, where some other numbskull would come in and go, well, let's take the trees out, man. We need a bigger house. We need more square footage right here. So this whole process is about a lot of, this whole process, all these projects, they're a lot about models and drawings and three-dimensional representation. Um, you know, I was talking about the constituent planes that make up volume. Well, here we have black and coloration, which is establishes. We were, we were, the, the, that was the one kind of lost battle in that project because we wanted to distinguish between planes, exterior planes, interior planes via color, so that the constituent geometric elements that made up the kind of hierarchy, like the planes that make up the volumes, would be, could be clearly observed as part of the experience. Like you have a plane here. If you walk into this space and this wall is a color or a different material, right, from this one, this one has to work with a projector. But, you know, whatever. You have like an articulation of a volume instead of the kind of a drywall hosed world. So, you know, this is a quarter scale model, an early, pretty early model, watercolor. Before the ridge was enclosed, this idea about really connecting to the site, right? You walk outdoors, and then you walk into the addition, and then you're indoors. So you have this kind of slap of air, outdoor air. But, you know. Anyway, the first, very first presentation has a tiny model, like really small, so they couldn't get all involved in the detail, kind of like just a positional diagrammatic kind of character, archetypal character, where you have the glass volume on top of so, you know, you just, it's like it avoids discussions about um, material and enha enhances or supports discussions about conceptual direction. So there's the plan. Total ground floor was, was, was gutted and redone, and then the garage up on the right and the um, kitchen. And then the piece that so much of this slide has been about is that piece. You can see the bridge going across the glass. So that's the site, and that's the site plan. Again, um, one of the strategies was if you disengage an existing house instead of building right next to it, then you start to develop pavilions that can exist out in the yard, have stairways to grade, connect to the landscape, which is really the asset out there. I mean, if you have a site like that, the canyon and ocean views, that's the asset, right? If you can't figure that out, then you're always going to be fighting kind of the battle against the core issue. So keeping the trees, dismantling the project as much as possible in the conceptual stage so that these pieces kind of, there are more views, like each piece has like more open sides for views and, and actual physical connections to the site. I mean, I mean it could have been anything. If like they could have put a Spanish tile roof on it, it still would have been a good project. I mean, just from a basic use standpoint. I mean, we wouldn't have been the ones to put tile on the roofs, but you get my meaning. At some basic conceptual level, the project would be strong. It doesn't have to do with how thin, you know, the roof edge is, which is really important, but you know, from a basic standpoint, this core issue at least holds through. So this is kind of a strange lecture for me. I mean, here I'm dissing my own work. That pool's gone too. Never built a pool. Actually, I don't see, I don't think of it as dissing my own work, but I, I think of it as being as like, you know, um, you guys are students, most of you, and so 
you know, or talk openly and objectively about your work, so I feel like I should be able to talk openly and objectively about mine. I'm not trying to sell you and tell you that like, everything I do is perfect, and I don't know too many students who do the same. They, you know, so I would say that, uh, I mean, a lot of what I've shown you is older stuff that's happened over time, that, that uh, I really actually like the work that I've done. I actually do, I swear. But uh, there's certain things about it which make me really impatient, and I think those things I've mentioned, and that is that you know architecture should be accessible, not not for people in wheelchairs, but for just basic people. And if it becomes if architecture is attached necessarily to budget, then it's attached necessarily to issues of class and social status. And I, I think that's just. Uh, you know, that's, that's just a bunch of crap. So the question I'm asking myself now is, you know, given the kind of the necessary temporality or the, nece the you know, the necessary tra uh, transitory nature of a lot of building projects, like I was talking about commercial, um, what can you do at, but if you accept the transitory nature, like you of the projects, and you accept, like you accept the uh, battalion stone pines on that site, right? If you accept the fact that that our good architecture should be attainable, not necessarily to only those who have, you know, the surplus income to afford it, then you start looking for expediencies, right? Well, in another language, those are called, you know, like accommodations to the criteria. <laughs> listening to the issues, listening to people. Uh, I've gotten very interested in listening to what clients have to say and trying to listen very carefully to sites and situations. Like I can't, I don't know how many times I went into D'Angelo and just stood in the space and went, what is going on here? There's all these stuff, I hate this space. You know, it's like all these walls were in there and this gabled roof, you know, I like have a theoretical problem of gabled roofs. And, you know, and I'm trying to figure out how with, with 50 cents to try and make a great project out of it. So, you know, the question really, it was really then, okay, you can listen to the space, listen to the clients, listen to the space some more, listen to the clients, listen to your own at reactions and responses. So some of it, so much, so much of it now has really become about listening. I would, you know, I've got, actually I'm talking to this woman right now who I have, I have, didn't even have to convince her that she wants to build a house studio in Santa Barbara, and, she, and it's, we're talking about using you know, plastic and fabric to build this thing. And, you know, that's okay with her. It's certainly okay with me. And I live, I have, I, I spend a lot of time, I don't live there full time, but I spend a lot of time in Carpinteria, and there's probably, I don't know, a few million square feet of greenhouses up there. And it's incredible. I mean, just when you drive by or you can see them from different roads or from different views, up above or down below, you get up close, it's a bit scary, you know, because they're all just sort of, you know, big pieces of plastic and plywood all tacked on and nailed onto each other. But um, they're really beautiful structures and they're incredibly cheap. And, and so I was I'm thinking about, okay, well, how do I use this? But do some of the other things. How do I bring what I know, what I've done, into that realm where it's accessible? So I, I, I've gotten perversely to like it where people say, I don't have any money. I think, good. That means one of two things. You say, okay, you know, you can do great architecture if you don't have any money. There's no question about it. But you, do you have, I don't actually put it in these words, right? Because they wouldn't like it. But. I'd say, do you have the, the nerve you know, to do great architecture with that much money? Or do you want to try and do something which has aspirations or pretensions to, oh, you know, highly crafted, sort of labor-intensive project, what? and spend no money on it? Well, there's a lot of people like that, a lot of clients, potential clients like that. It's a recipe for failure. So, I mean, you have to have a little bit of nerve to do great work with no money, but, but that's like the first question. So this, this one woman in particular is kind of like intriguing, so I'm hoping something happens with her. So I'm trying to get everybody to spend no money. 
That's all. Thank you. So that my, 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 my strategy, of course, was to critique my own work so that now you guys don't feel inspired to, you know, you don't have to see, it's already been criticized, there's nothing for you to say, right? I mean, I beat you to it. But I, I would be really disappointed if anybody asked any questions. Sorry? Just a tiny one? I don't think. Yeah. And now that the work is getting smaller and tighter, there's not so much money. So the sort of theory is getting displaced by the necessity of cost. You know, in order to do anything, you're trying to find a way of uh, inventing a of architecture that wouldn't rely on the good. Yeah. But it's interesting, behind all the work, behind all the discussion, is uh, the most uh, seminal. I actually don't, you know, I, 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 um, I don't see it as being this opposition between theory and practice. I see it as being like a theory being achieved somehow, or clarity about a theory being achieved through a, a practice, a process of practice. I think if it's if it's if it's a social observation about accessibility of architecture that informs kind of an approach to the language of architecture, then that has become a, a theoretical, you know, set of criteria, establishing a theoretical set of criteria. I mean, I think availability is a huge issue. I think it's, it's an ethical issue, I think. It's not my sole thing, except it's what I've been thinking about a lot lately. So rather than just showing you a bunch of projects and talking about what I was thinking about then, I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking about now. But I definitely see it as being, um, a manifestation of, I mean, I'm not a philosopher, but as a, of a kind of a social theory, like about listening and responding to need. If people are interested in symbolism, I, I'm, that's not, I mean, I can't say, well, whatever the audience wants, like some kind of a TV producer, right? But more, this is an answer to some questions. Why not? And so, so the, so the, the language of, you know, the kind of, the, the still language, the point line, plane hierarchy, this kind of isolation of, like, you know, um, sp spatial types in, within the project body, you know, that you saw in some of this stuff, the articulation of parts of the building, using those pieces as, as, as ways of creating tension. So there's like a third thing, it's not just a category of pieces, but those pieces kind of, there's tension between the pieces. I mean, that's all part of something that the, you know, that, that's brought to bear on this other, I mean, hopefully it's brought to bear on this other question of availability. You know, to me, that's, that's really, and it is, it's about money and it's about the world that we live in and it's about, you know, whatever middle class. It's about money and relationships Yeah. Yeah, not right now. Just pursuing the work that um, you know that I have and new work. I mean, I really focused on this idea of just you know doing projects. I, I think there's a kind of a limit to how far I, I, I can go with that because um, 
because of my impatience with completed projects. I mean, I really enjoy kind of making something physically pres present, like, you know, but I'm also impatient with them as soon as they're done. I don't, I don't want to really talk about them anymore. I, I just want to go and do another project and use my, the knowledge and information that came from doing that, go on and do the next one, you know? Yeah. That was then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's, to me, it's, it's a, a sort of the architect's lament. Well, someday you'll get a budget, project with a great budget and a client with vision and, you know, I, 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 I think, it's, it's true that all these people that I've been meeting that, you know, and, and talking to about projects and doing work with uh, clients, you know, the, the money is, is, is always an issue. Whether people talk about it or not, it's always an issue. If some people pretend it's not, it ends up being an issue. It's the thing which makes the problem. I mean, that is the single set of, that's just like a powerful criteria in terms of trying to achieve building. So I like the spatial qualities, but I don't think they're necessarily attached to the fact that the material is brought from Frankfurt in a container. I mean, I would use that material again, and I'd work on a project. I mean, I'm not saying like I'm high and mighty or anything. I would work on a project that had a budget, and I'd be happy to do it. But what I'm talking about is most of the people and most of the need is about people who have this idea of the symbolic content of place. And the whole idea about craft and, 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 the, and the cost to achieve that, it's attached to the symbolic content. But their means, their available, you know, their available tools to accomplish that aren't, don't match. And so you have this kind of lunacy of people who, like, say, you know, I can do, we can do this thing for $50 a square foot, but you are, you're not on board. I mean, you don't accept the fact that, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to look like, you know, somebody's, Two hundred dollars square foot. Price. It's got to be handled in a different way. So we did the other day. Sarah Graham came to lecture. Yeah. And she closed it in a way that I understand. But I told her about one of people there. The way she she challenged some ideals of sort of compositional aesthetics or formal aesthetics, and talked about. Um, only in the sense of that impermanence can become becomes part of uh, potentially, uh, you know, beautiful, shabby and the impermanent. Or the shabby and the impermanent become potentially part of what's beautiful. In the sense that, I mean, not like the purposely or the contrived, the shabby, but the sense that stuff which has an informality and that it, it, it changes more quickly because of weather and use. Right. But no, it, no, not necessarily. It's just the way I'm thinking about it right now. I was gonna say no. I mean, 
this is, I mean, the things that I'm thinking about using it, it's probably, it's whatever, my, you know, kind of intellectual resources at the current time. It's the stuff that I'm thinking about using is stuff that changes more quickly with the passage of time and sunlight and water and things like that. But I think that's, um, it doesn't bother me. I mean, you know that if you build a house out of wood and if you don't fumigate it every five years, that in 20 years, you're going to have to spend $150,000 rebuilding the structure of it because it's going to be eaten by termites. So it's like this whole, it's like this, it's, you know, I mean, that's, that's not my, my, my main point, but there's kind of an inherent... Yeah. But that's not the way people build now. That's not the way people build now. No. It's actually, it's... Yeah.
So I mean, I'm not going to try and argue, you know, on a scholar level that that's like the gospel, but that's just the way I approach it. So my basic approach is basically the same. It's just, you know, the resources available. I think that makes space. I know for for a fact that you know, whereas D'Angelo is this, you know, playing to be attached to the turning, has a lot to do with the excellent geometry of the space, and it's inserted in the way where it works with the excellent geometry of the space. But I think that it's kind of the ephemera and the ambiguity of the space that just it comes from. So there's kind of an ambition for uh, the space, the quality of light, the kind of transitory quality. It's not necessarily attached to you know, this discussion about light. I think in many ways, fabric is going to back to what I did to um, you know, the spread of a lot of spaces. I would say that also uh, your point about permanence, which may have been a growing feeling for you, uh, predicated on the notion that if you build something cheaper, just in real physical terms, it won't last like uh, you know, that you're building. I think the idea that maybe in America, especially in school, that architecture is permanent is a sort of weird and inherited thing from Europe because even if you look at the whole yeah. concept of of modern work in, in brought to California it lasts a lot longer than if you go see uh, uh, Dutch modernist work which can't survive because it doesn't have enough um, maintenance behind it and joints and overlap and, and uh, transparency and things like that are not inherently about uh, surviving 500 years without which require you know maintenance budgets whereas Stone building in, in Europe, uh, the whole uh, drive for uh, permanence actually came out of just that's the way you built. And so we inherited the weight without the material. Right. And it seems to be fine to say that architecture, especially now, even in the face of an economic uh, of people, is, is impermanent. In Japan, they can build concrete building and have no problems with tearing it down for years because concrete collapses under wrecking balls and changes in economy. Who gives a shit about how heavy and how many years it can sit there? Boom, there's a force much greater than the whole act of, you know, uh, withering away. And so I think we do have to understand it to be permanent on all, you know, sorts of levels. Uh, and not just getting ourselves over this to the water. Well, yeah, yeah. But actually design strategies that you don't see your building suffer a, a horrible decapitation or fate, as though you want it to be something that it's not. Yeah, well, that's not what I think. I don't think that's what you're saying. It's adding that to No, there's a lot of stuff missing. I, I don't know. I have seen so many lectures where work is presented as like this, you know, this kind of serial, complete thing. It's actually, you know, I mean, I presented it in this sort of bad way. Like, but verbally, it isn't in a better way. It just means that I'm just asking questions about what I do and where I'm going here because I don't want to see projects over there. The idea that it's like, you know, I don't know. So, you can talk about it in these very flat, but kind of rapid terms, which is the term that you should have been able to do. But I would say the, the one thing I'm glad that, that this point came up is that this is a very, very important piece. This idea of ephemera related to this idea of that cost. It's not just about cost. Ephemera is not a product of cost. I, mean, I like the idea of the ephemeral. So some of those very first slides you saw where it's like the wall is not, I mean, what is the wall? It's not really that clear. The light fills the wall in a certain way. It's not glass. You know, like it's addressing the cost issues. So be it. But there's an interest there in the fabric breaks too, which you can see in the playhouse as well. So those are just little projects. You know, these are little projects that they're like, Thoughts. Well, I don't know what these things, but hopefully, uh, this is. I think you said something about the. Uh, in your new thing, about the rest of the portable, whatever the building. Uh, also, some of the decisions that are made uh, being accountable for the portable. I'm not sure I can't put anything into that, but going back to the. Concrete buildings that are being built in Japan that have been torn down in a few years or whatever. To me, 
uh, accessibility to your architecture or architecture for people, basically I think uh, boils down a lot to the materiality that you begin to choose to express yourself in. And you mentioned before that the use of certain materialities, uh, such as hard woods or concrete or steel, or generally higher priced items that, that throw architecture into that realm of you know a beautiful thing that costs a lot of money to afford. Is there any way to question those material choices in your work and begin to place it in more of a realm that's more accessible by virtue of the material, not so much uh, the craftsmanship? You know, like, like you replace one of the other, you give up craftsmanship for material or material for craftsmanship in one way or the other. You know? I don't think they're necessarily exchanged. I mean, they're not necessarily interchangeable. I would say that, that there was some stuff on that. He would look at that building and say, 